The title of this session is called the Early Jesus Movement. And that's intentional. Nobody used the word Christians to describe Christianity at this time. There, it wasn't in the Gospels. It wasn't in Paul's letters. It was really what it is. It was a movement within Judaism that believed in Jesus and his and his being the Messiah. Uh, if, if I can, I, oh, so uh, let me summarize what we learned last week for you all. Uh, go ahead. So, um, uh, most people living in Palestine at that time were on a brutal economic domination system, which uh, provided wealth for the top 1% of the population, and everybody else was working hard and paying taxes to this official existence, much like any other domination system that has existed over time. It wasn't unique, but certainly it was characteristic. Um, Jesus was only one of many people at the time that was responding to this economic difficulty and the need for people to find some hope in their life. Uh, there were a lot of people. Some of them were obvious hucksters. Some of them were delivering true messages of compassion. So Jesus was among many that was going on at the time. Um, um, but he was unique. First of all, he was a charismatic personality. No question. Uh, he, he was also consistent with the messages that had been delivered through the Old Testament that people knew, certainly through a word of mouth. Nobody, it was not a literate society. It wasn't like people were rushing back and reading the Old Testament. But they knew these stories because they were passed along. And a lot of his messages derived directly from those messages coming from the Old Testament. So, for instance, uh, God's covenant with the Jews. Uh, his, his, uh, uh, Jesus' defiance of wealth and power. First will be last, the last will be first. That was one of his messages. And finally, uh, in, in, in offering a, whole, a message of hope and salvation, his charis charismatic personality, his message hit the mark because people hadn't heard it so often before. Um, uh, Jesus, uh, Rome saw Jesus as uh, a troublemaker, uh, as a seditious figure. Uh, it was, he wasn't alone, by the way. There were, there were a group of people who were committed to fighting against Rome, a little bit like the ISIS of the times. So it's not like he was a unique figure, but they associated his message with this underground movement in <laughs> the Roman government. And as a result, he was tried, he was put to death. Um, uh, now, the story of his resurrection, re resurrection came following his death. It's not clear, by the way, <clears throat> that the resurrection actually happened. What we know is through the scriptures. And I'm not suggesting, by the way, this is, this is, this is a made-up story, but we don't have any historical information to confirm this. And for me, it doesn't matter, personally. It doesn't matter because this story of his resurrection uh, radiates throughout Christendom. We believe it. And, and it's an inspirational message, whether it actually occurred or whether it's a story that's generated following his crucifixion. For me, the message is there for all of us anyway. So um, that, that was the message from last week. I'll entertain uh, one or question, question two, and then we'll jump in. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, okay. Um, uh, this is a summary of what we're going to talk about. The, the, the books that we are going to be talking about today, Letters of Paul and the Gospels, were written anywhere from 20 to 80 years after his death. Now you can imagine, and these were built on oral traditions. It was built on stories that people told one another over time. Are they absolutely historical accurate? Who knows? But you can imagine that over time, some of these stories could become 
a little less based on what might actually have happened and much more on what people believed at the time. It, again, it doesn't matter for me. It's it, These are stories that have great impact for us all. Um, they were written, both letters of Paul and the Gospels were written for a very small audience. There were probably 2,000 people or so that were responding to the message of Jesus and Messiah. Many of them were in Palestine, around the temple. Many of them were in the diaspora, outside of Palestine, where Paul did most of his work. Um, they, they, Paul's letters were addressed to various communities. We we'll talked a little bit about his travels and about the communities that he, he ministered to. Um, and it, it's fair to say the four Gospels, I think, were less histories, although there's some historical fact in there, less histories and more faith statements. And it's those, it's those faith statements that continue to buoy us all in our belief in what we see of Jesus as Messiah. Um, we're going to talk about the four Gospels. We're going to talk about the Book of Revelation. Now, the Book of Revelation, by the way, is the granddaddy of all apocalypse stories. <laughs> it's hard to find an apocalypse story that is more graphic and more rich in its texture and its symbolism than Revelation. We're not going to get into the details of Revelation today except to characterize it, but I would urge you, pick it up and read the first three or four books and uh, you'll get it. By the way, do you have a Bible? You know? yeah. I may ask you to read a few sections of the Bible, one of which will come from Revelation. So you'll get a flavor of, of the rhetoric that's in Revelation. Uh, I've asked, uh, oh, I read it in double duty here. Sorry. Oh, no. Thank you very much. I mean, how many more readings? Uh, well, I'll, I'll have, uh, I may pass it around, have somebody read it. Um, <clears throat> oh, go ahead. I think John. Okay, now this is a map of Paul's travels. We're going to talk about the gospel, the, uh, the letters of Paul first. This is a map of Paul's travels. You can see he had several journeys, they're all in color code, but you can see that the man traveled thousands of miles. What what kind of commitment was this? And by the way, as when he went, when he went to Rome, he had to venture out of the Mediterranean Sea. This was before all the technology that we have to figure out where you are in a large body of water. Generally, if you went on water, you followed the land at the time because it was there, you could see it. If you ventured out to where Paul went, it was a real, it, it was a voyage. And I, the point here is that this, this was a brave and committed man who was delivering the message of Jesus and his, his Messiah status to the people of the time. Um, Paul himself was born in Tarsus, which is uh, it's in what is now modern-day Turkey. He was born in Tarsus. His father was a Roman citizen, and as a result, he was a Roman citizen, very well educated in both Latin and Greek and Hebrew. Uh, he was raised, and they sent him to Jerusalem. He was raised as, as a Pharisee. Now, last week, we talked a little bit about Sadducees and Pharisees. Sadducees were the gatekeepers for the, for the five books of Moses. There was little else to worry about from for their point of view than the five books of Moses. All the prophets, all the wisdom books were less important. And the Sadducees were also the keepers of order. They were in line, in league with the Roman government to make sure there was peace in Palestine. They were not loved by the population. Pharisees, on the other hand, were much more <clears throat> broad-based in their understanding of what Judaism meant. And they focused, in addition to the five books of the Torah, they focused on the prophets and the wisdom books uh, and, and as well. And Paul was probably raised as a Pharisee. As a matter of fact, Jesus' teaching were very much as what a Pharisee might have been. So uh, Paul was raised as a Pharisee. Uh, he, uh, what do I, um, <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> so uh, this the story of his conversion is, is clear. 
And by the way, uh, Paul was a mystic. What's a mystic? Mystic is somebody who's, who has what, what amounts to a personal interaction, personal contact with Jesus or with God. Uh, never mind the scripture. Paul had a personal experience. And this personal experience informed his letters. We'll talk more about that. But it all derived from his, his personal conversion experience on the road to Damascus. All well charted in Paul's letters. Uh, uh, yeah, I wonder if somebody could grab a Bible. Whoever grabs it first, grab a Bible. Grab a Bible. Corinthians, a uh, second Corinthians. Chapter 11, or book 11, uh, verses 23 to 28. Sorry to uh, yeah, spray this on you. Second Corinthians? Yep. Now this is uh, Paul, uh, 11, 11, book 11, chapter 11, verses 23 to 28. This is the description of Paul's accounts of his voyage. And you can... Uh, of course, it's his own, and maybe, maybe he's inflated a little bit here, but I don't think so. Um, could, could you read that? Are they ministers of Christ? I am talking like a a madman. I am a I am a better one, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless floggings, and often near death. Five times I have received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked for a night and a day. I was adrift at sea. Only frequent, on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from bandits, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters, and toil with hardship through many of sleep a sleepless night. You you get the picture. <laughs> this was a this this was hard work. And Paul did this. Uh, some of these accounts by the way are written up in Acts in addition to his his uh, version in Corinthians. But take a look at it. It's pretty impressive. Um, we got here. Um, okay. Um, the uh, the number of Jews in the diaspora. Now, this is the, the, the being defined as that part of the world outside Palestine. There were more Jews in the diaspora than there were in the, in Palestine, uh, and this was part of Paul's mission. Uh, was to begin preaching to those Jews outside of the diaspora. Uh, could you click on the uh, video? Convinced that God had chosen him to spread the word about Jesus, he traveled to Antioch. Convinced that God had chosen him to spread... Convinced that God had chosen him to spread... That's all right. I, I can, well, I'll, I'll characterize the video, make it easier. So, um, uh, Paul. Okay, I think, I think I might do it. I think I might do it. <laughs> okay. Let me. Sounds like the beginning of the video. Yeah. Uh, my portion. copy these videos and then you have to shrink it down to that portion of video. Yeah. But let, let me characterize what that video is trying to tell you. Um, Paul spent much of his time in outside of Palestine. You there? Know, why? Because that's where he was from. And, and he spent much of his time, at least at the beginning of his ministry, in in uh, in, 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 in Turkey. Um, the 
The point of the video is that there were lots of Jews living in some of these towns. Uh, they came together. They were in social groups. They attracted Gentiles because, frankly, there wasn't a whole lot you could do uh, similar to what you could find in synagogue outside of synagogue. So Gentiles came just to be in social interaction with others. And this is where Paul began quoting his message, that is, for uh, Gentiles. Uh, he wasn't out to, to establish Christianity. He wasn't out to do anything else but preach the word as he understood it about uh, Jesus and, and his, his being Messiah. Um, one of the difficulties there is in being uh, in receiving this message as a Gentile is that many Jews felt that the only people who could receive this message were Jews. And if you are a Jew, you need to undergo certain what? <laughs> right. <laughs> to convert to Judaism. And uh, these procedures uh, require a commitment. And, <laughs> and, and um, so, so the question became, well, do you have to become a Jew to receive the message that Paul is, is generating? And, and Paul's answer was, well, no. Jesus is offering a message to us all, not just to Jews. Now, it was a reform movement in Judaism. Paul was not suggesting that he was going to break off as a separate sect. He was just saying this message is important for us all. That was the big thing. Okay. Um, by the way, uh, if, if you were to go on, on YouTube, uh, there there is a two hour, actually three hour frontline uh, video on uh, the, the beginnings of Christianity. Check it out. I, I use this considerably and uh, trying to present this as my own work, but it's not. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about the letters of Paul. There, were, there are 13 of them. Uh, we think that about seven Paul was directly responsible for. Now, we had a team of people. It wasn't just Paul holed up uh, in, in a corner of the world. He had a team of people that helped him write and distribute these letters. Uh, that he didn't walk these letters back to Corinth or Rome or wherever. He had them sent out. So he, he had a real team with him. Um, th three of the letters were probably not written by him at all. They're, they're, they're characterized as Timothy 1 and 2 and Titus. Uh, they required a network of associates. Um, oh, uh, the, these letters were not meant to be read. They were oral. That's the way people communicated at this time, oral. So they were meant to be spoken to the community and written as such. Um, and uh, the we're probably talking about small numbers of people that populated these churches as written in the letters of Paul. Maybe at the outside, it might have been 100 people, but generally these the, the, the groups were small. 20, 30, 40 people. We're not talking about a huge movement here, which are talking about really an intimate conversation between Paul and this church. And in some ways, of, of the content of the letters, it, it characterizes that. He, he, often, he, except for Romans, he wasn't talking about broad theological statements. He might talk a little bit about their attitude toward women or, or what they thought about the, the local population. They, he was responding to specific issues that had come out and that, that he felt he needed to address. Um, what else here? Uh, is that it? Okay, let's, yeah, let's move on. Um, so what was his message? Um, much of what we believe in Christianity today came out of Paul's letters. I had, a, uh, I had a history professor when I was in graduate school, and he said, look, it shouldn't be called Christianity, it should be called Paulism. Uh, <laughs> now, he was a little bit of a strong statement, but still, a lot of what, a lot of the ideas, a lot of theology that we, that we believe in today 
comes from Paul's letters. Um, his use of Jesus is Lord. We don't, we, we say that automatically today. Jesus is Lord. But at the time, Lord had a, a double meaning. It came from the Greek word kyrios, which is both a spiritual leader and a political leader. And I, we believe that Paul used this term deliberately to confuse the difference between Jesus and his theological spiritual mission on one hand and his mission to minister people in the real world on the other. Uh, it was not noticed at the time, but, but it became noticed later on. So it's, it's important that we understand his, uh, his use of the term Jesus is Lord. Um, and he, he was also very focused on the crucifixion and the resurrection. For Paul, Jesus, first and foremost, was a man. He was a person. He existed. He was real. And he was crucified. And as a result of that crucifixion, he was raised by the Lord. It was a reality for Paul. Now, next week, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the other Gospels and how different they were. But one of them said, Paul Jesus as essentially a divine figure. He was always divine. He started divine. He came to earth as divine. His ministry was divine. He left. He was never a real man. For Paul, this got at, this, this attacked the heart of his message. We, he was human. We are all human. He was crucified. Yes, we might say, have the same fate, but the revelation is a promise to us all. It was a really important part of Paul's message and a very important part of what we believe today. Sorry, I'm getting a little, uh, <laughs> get a little emotional here. Excuse me. <laughs> I mentioned that he was a mystic. Uh, and you can see in his letter that he had a personal experience with this with Jesus, uh, which he brought to his letters and which became a very important part of his ministry. He believed that we all have that capability, all that possibility of having this very personal, very mystical relationship with, with, uh, with God and with Christ. And again, when I use the word mystic, I'm not saying it's, it's a magician. It's a very important that we understand the difference between a mystic and a magician. This was not simply hocus pocus. This was not a rabbit out of the hat. This was a personal experience that Paul had and that we potentially all can share. Um, and of course, as an important part of this message of piety. And by the way, uh, the message here in Christianity is very similar to the same pious message that we see in Islam. All of these, these, these religions feature, in addition to their theology, in importance that we live a good and godly life. So, Paul's message, uh, I, should, I should back up and say, I am not in, in, in the Gospels, please. I've never been to seminary. Uh, we have people in this room who have been, who are far more expert than I. All I'm talking about is sort of the history of the scripture. And beyond that, please. I ain't your guy. <laughs> okay. Um, next. Um, I'm doing all the time here. Uh, okay. So uh, after the, for the next 10 years, um, uh, Paul's, we, we, we talked about this conflict in, in Antioch. This is where he had a, a, a disagreement with the elders of, of, of Judaism who came up from Jerusalem. And there was a disagreement to say, look, you either have to be a Jew to receive this message, or, or you, you, you can't. And uh, for Paul, I believe it was a much more uh, Catholic, if you will, um, message for us all. Uh, this was the beginning. We're going to talk more about this later in the, in the session. This is the beginning of the split between the Jesus movement as it existed within Judaism and it becoming a separate religion. It took a long time for this to happen, but this disagreement with Paul and the elders in Jerusalem but, uh, between when, whether you needed to be a Jew or not to receive the message of Christ started. 
Um, I'm going to talk more about the revolt uh, in the next video. Um, uh, but in, in 70 or so, uh, there was a revolt in Jerusalem against Roman rule, successful in the sense that they chased Rome out. Well, not going to happen on the Rome's watch. It took them a while. It took them three or four years to finally gather the, the military necessary. They came to Jerusalem. They destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. And at the center of Jew Jewish life, the temple is gone. Uh, you can go to the next. Uh, uh, yeah, I have a uh, video here. We'll be able to get well, this. Let's see if we can get this one. It's okay. If not, I'll, I'll talk through the video. The failure of the first revolt really was a, a traumatic event for everyone living yeah. in the Jewish yeah. homeland, Jews and Christians alike. As a result, they had to start rethinking some of their own assumptions. When Jerusalem was destroyed, a whole new series of questions had to be asked. What do we do without the temple? Where is the source of our faith and our authority? What does God want us to do? This era was an age of definition, not just for Christianity, but also for Judaism. It marks the emergence for the first time into the light of history of a new group and a new culture and a new literature and a new way of thinking and writing. Without the temple, the priesthood that had presided over its rituals lost its power. There emerged new leaders, the Pharisees, rabbis who would lead the Jewish people in a new direction. And the rabbis represent for us a new age of definition. It is the rabbis who now emerge as a new kind of Judaism, and it is this Judaism which will endure from the second century of our era down to our own age. The failure of the First Revolt also created a crisis for early Christians who were still a part of Judaism. The kingdom had not come. The Messiah had not arrived. The followers of Jesus coped by telling stories about the man they had expected would deliver the new kingdom on earth. We have to remember that Jesus died around 30. For 40 years, there's no written gospel of his life until after the revolt. During that time, we have very little in the way of written records within Christianity. Our first writer in the New Testament is Paul, and his first letter is dated around 50 to 52, so still a good 20 years after Jesus himself. But it appears that in between the death of Jesus and the writing of the first gospel, Mark, that they clearly are telling stories. They're passing on the tradition of what happened to Jesus, what he stood for, and what he did orally by telling it and retelling it. Meeting in each other's homes, early Christians told stories of Jesus' parables and miracles and of his suffering and death. These were not historical accounts, but shared memories shaped by a common past. Legend and myth and hymn and prayer are the vehicles in which oral traditions develop. One could, for example, imagine that the oldest way in which the early Christians told about Jesus' suffering and death was the hymn that Paul quotes in Philippians 2. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Paul quotes this hymn in the early 50s of the first century. 
He quotes this as a hymn that probably was sung in the Christian communities uh, 10 or 20 years earlier. Um, that is the way in which you first uh, tell the story. Uh, and that you tell the story in the form of a hymn also shows that the telling of the story is anchored in the worship life of the community. So here is really the beginning of the oral tradition. It seems that over time, some of these stories came to be written down and are what came to be thought of as the gospel, the good news, the story of Jesus. So, um, a couple points here. One is that Paul believed that Jesus' return was imminent. It would happen in his lifetime. That sense of imminence was gone after the revolt. No longer do people believe, and the Gospels reflect this, by the way, that his return is imminent. It will happen, but sometime in the future. The second point I want to make here is the use of psalms, use of hymns. Psalms is essentially a collection of hymns. Uh, he talks about how unique this was to Christianity. It had, it, this was a tradition that was quite uh, a much a part of the Old Testament. Is uh, These hymns, these, these poems, part of the oral tradition that help generate a lot of the Gospels that we see in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's the way people shared stories. So next time you're reading a psalm, just envision yourself as being part of a little community <laughs> learning about whatever the message of the psalm was at that time. For me, it becomes a much more personal way of understanding what the Bible says and, and, and how it's portrayed. Okay, um, the Gospels, um, um, but by the way, the, the term Gospel comes from the term Godspell. You may have, there were a couple of Broadway plays that included Godspell. Uh, and Godspell was a, a, a origin of the word, the Greek word evangelism, evangelicals. And this word, like Lord, had a double meaning. Evangelical was a message from the Gospels and from Jesus. It was also the name of the official pronouncements of Caesar. So uh, this is an interesting double play on words that we find, frankly, subtly throughout the Gospels. They were trying to kind of be a little subtle. Nobody wanted to draw a lot of attention to Christians at the time, but it was there in the Gospels. Um, uh, we're here. Um, we've, we talked about uh, faith statements. Uh, I'm not going to get into scripture except to say that these gospels were written for a particular time with a particular message with a particular audience. And each one, of them, we're going to talk about each gospel and what its message was. Hope we have the time. But that's the point here. These, these were not meant for us to read. These were meant for people at the time to read. It's important that we understand the historical context. For me, it brings a great deal more meaning to it. Uh, in addition to the spiritual um, uh, uh, significance of the Gospels, they, they are a piece of history. And understand how this piece of history lasted for centuries, for millennia, is an important part, I think, of the appeal of the Christian message. Silence makes me nervous, but, <laughs> but that's okay. We'll continue on. Uh, if you can... Uh, oh, uh, one other thing. The, the four Gospels that we're talking about today were selected as being part of the canon. They weren't meant to be a part when they were written. And there were many Gospels. We're going to talk about this next week. There were many Gospels at the time, some of which were later judged as heresies. So this was one among many. Okay. Um, have you heard of the Synoptic Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke. There you go. There you go. They're, they're, they're similar in the sense that they, they contain the same, some of the same stories. 
Um, uh, references to John the Baptist, uh, the formation of, of, of the 12 disciples. Uh, I'll let you read, uh, but but th there's some common stories here. Um, even, but, even, but they were all written at different times with a different idea in mind. <laughs> um, and John was unique. We'll talk about how how he was unique, unique in, in a few minutes, but it's a very different gospel than the synoptic gospels which preceded it. And John, by the way, was written about 110. Uh, Mark was written about 70. So between 70 and 110, all the four gospels are written, different audiences, different message. Uh, okay. Uh, Mark. This was the first of the four gospels. It's important to recognize that this was probably written shortly after the destruction of the temple. And there are phrases in Mark which refers to the destruction of physical uh, property. Uh, this was a message about Jesus and about privation and about difficulty, largely came in on, coming out of that experience of the destruction of the temple. It was a very, very much of a focus. So Jesus' life and his privation and his difficulty were, were described in greater detail in Mark than almost any of the other Gospels. It, it was the message of the time. Um, oh, uh, yes. Uh, and in Mark, there's something called the Messianic secret. Have you heard of this expression? Um, there are several times in Mark where one of the disciples says, uh, Jesus, you are the Messiah, aren't you? And Jesus says, Please don't don't mention that. So Mark was not about establishing Jesus as a Messiah. Mark was about Jesus as establishing Jesus as a figure of crucifixion, of uh, of, of sacrifice, much more so than in any of the other gospels. Mm -hmm. um, oh, here are some quotes that, that are, are mentioned in, in Mark, referring to the to the destruction of the, of the temple. Interestingly enough, the first account, first mark had no description of the resurrection. It was it was an empty tomb. If you read Mark today in your Bible, it should say this portion added 200 years later, where they talk about the the the, uh, the uh, resurrection, but not at the time. The, the messianic secret. This was a very important part of Mark's gospel. Okay, um, moving on. I think we're going to get there. Matthew, written about 15 years or so after. This was an attempt to establish uh, Jesus' lineage with all the Old Testament histories and figures. If you read uh, chapter 1, verse 1 in Matthew, it goes through a, a agonizingly long history of all the people Starting from David, marching through every name they can think of up to the up to Jesus, it was an attempt to establish his lineage, his importance with connections with the Old Testament, very much a part of Matthew. He was ministering to a, a, a community within Judaism that, that he they felt needed to understand not just Jesus' message, but his connection with all of the oral traditions coming out of the Old Testament. Um uh, interestingly enough, uh, the Sermon on the Mount that is, is written up in Matthew is divided into five blocks, much like the five books of the Torah. Again, the, the need to identify what Jesus was doing with the traditions of the Old Testament. Um, in Matthew and in Luke, the Pharisees are considered evil. They are the ones responsible for Jesus' death. Well, at the time, Paul and others were having a little internal conflict within Judaism about whether you needed to be a Jew or not to accept the message of Jesus. And Matthew was saying, you guys have got it wrong. You don't need to be a Jew. And, and as a result, characterized Pharisees in a very negative way, even though historically we we can't show that. Mm -hmm. 
But you you will read that in both Luke and in Matthew. Just to understand that Pharisees weren't necessarily bad guys, but it was an important message to have at the time because of the uh, dispute between Judaism with those who believe that Jesus is the Messiah and those who believe that Judaism should be traditional to uh, to, to the Old Testament beliefs. Yes, sir. Uh, Messiah was promised in Genesis after the fall of Adam and Eve. And that's so they were expecting a Messiah to restore the close relationship with God that was lost by Adam and Eve. Yeah, the Messiah is mentioned many times in the Old Testament. The question is, does that refer to Jesus? And the answer is, mm, uh, maybe, maybe not. It's, 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 it's great to, to see all of that history in the Old Testament uh, characterizing Jesus and his mission, but these were written, these, the Old Testament was written at a particular time for a particular audience without any necessary reference to a later historical figure, just the kingdom of God, just a Messiah will come and save us all. Okay? Okay, so that's Matthew. Uh, Luke, and uh, I should say one more thing. Much of the Synoptic Gospels rely on Mark as the original Gospel. There's another Gospel, which we've lost in time. Uh, the scholars call it Q, which is German for Quelle, which means source. This second source, we don't know. But we think, given the material in the Synoptic Gospels, it did come from Mark, it must have come from another source. So both of Luke and Acts and Matthew rely on Mark and this Q source for its uh, for it, it, its its content. Um, you know, Luke and Acts were written as a two volume set, um, and uh, it, it was pro it probably written by a Gentile. By the way, these names Luke, Matthew, Mark probably weren't names of the time. They were names in, applied to the Gospels, which is fine. doesn't make any difference what their names are, but just to know probably several people may have contributed to these Gospels, and they probably weren't named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Probably. Um, the, the theme of the Spirit of God is much more prominent in Luke's version. This is the idea we often refer to the Holy Spirit. Uh, we we are uh, a tripartite religion. We believe in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These were not necessarily well-defined ideas in the Scripture. They have come to be well-defined over time, uh, but we begin seeing the first inkling of this idea in Luke, and it becomes much more fully explored in the Gospel of John. This idea of a spirit separate from Jesus, separate from God, existing in the world. Okay? Uh, I'm going to have to rush through this. I'm going to make sure that I get through all this. Um, um, in the book of Acts, the spirit is a central character in Acts. And by the way, the Acts is all about what happened following Jesus' uh, resurrection. It's, in some ways, a uh, history of Paul and his ministry, very much. Um, it is about as close to a history as we can expect from any of the Gospels. I'm not saying it's, it's historically accurate so much as it contains a lot of information that sounds like it probably happened. Um, let's see. Uh, let's, let's move on. I want, to, I want to make sure I get through this. Uh, so, Gospel of John. It was the last of the Gospels to, written, uh, to be written. And here, Jesus is less described as a historical figure and more of a spiritual figure. Uh, if you turn to the first verses in John, you'll see there is the Word. And the Word was with God. This idea of the Word, this idea of a spirit, is, to, is John spends some time with this, and it becomes the basis for uh, our belief in the three-part version of, of, of the Trinity, God, the Father, and the Spirit, located in John, 
fully fleshed out later on, by the way, by Augustine, we're going to talk about next week, and many of the traditions of the church. Much of what we believe today about our religion came afterwards, after the Gospels were written. And we'll talk more about that. I'm not saying we shouldn't believe it. Please don't quote me on that. What I'm saying is that much of what we see as Christian belief came out of work following the written the, the writing of the Gospels. Uh, John portrays the group as a as, as a separate uh, Christians as a separate group. We're, next week we're going to talk about the more official split between Christians on one hand and Jews on the other. But right now it was still a Jesus movement existing on you easily within Judaism. Yes. Would you say that was a theological civil war within Judaism in a way? Uh, well, some of some, yes, some of was, was theology. Some of it was tradition. This this is what a Jew does. Jews eat certain foods. They eat with certain people. And uh, and this these cultural traditions are very important part. Well, if you look at Jews today, how do they Orthodox Jews? How do they live? They live their lives in a very constricted Orthodox way because they believe that that, that they are true true to their tradition. So that's, it's very much a part of that. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Oh, his uh, John's account does not include the, the birth narrative. Uh, we talk about the word, um, and, and, and in this, in, in the Gospels, if the, Jesus is no longer Jesus returns, no longer seen as imminent. It's in the future, somewhere out there. We can rely on it, but just not now. Okay. I, I, I think we're going to make this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> time. Uh, Revelation. Uh, check it out. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to have. I'm not going to walk you through Revolution. Although I will have you read a portion. Uh, could somebody get the Bible again and go to Revelation? Do I have that here? There we go. Beginning. No, no. Um, well, is, maybe this is an old version. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's an old version. Uh, uh, I won't bother you with that. Uh, but there is an account. There's an account in chapter one of Revelation talking about Christ. And Christ is not this humble figure. He's a majestic figure. He's, he's clothed in these robes. He has this light and this power. He is, in many ways, a dominant, regal figure. That's what Revelation sets Jesus up to be. And Revelation sets up this huge struggle for uh, God and Jesus to come to the world, sort everybody out, identify the winners, identify the losers. And if you're uh, in your outs, you're really out. It, it is a very powerful book, misunderstood. Uh, one of the interesting things about Revelation, it has become doctrine for some Christians who believe that the time will come <clears throat> short, that we will all be saved and the sinners will be punished and the believers will be rewarded with salvation. It's a part of, of their belief system. Uh, you can also read Revelation as a kind of expanded metaphor for uh, what what life should be about, but not necessarily, a, not a prediction for what's going to happen in the future. Uh, read Revolution, Revelation for yourself. It's a very difficult book, but it gives you some idea. It, it's unlike any other gospel in the New Testament. It is an apocaly apocalyptic with a capital A. It's, it's short -term. It is so funny. We never hear any sermons on Revelation. <laughs> no, but I mean, I've heard maybe three sermons in total uh, on Revelation. No, no wonder. And I don't know that, that anybody knows what to do with Revelation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wouldn't would either. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Who would have written Revelation? Where where did that originate? Uh, so, so the author is supposedly somebody uh, from, uh, named John. 
of Patmos, which is an island in the Mediterranean. Um, now, how, how he came up with this vision that's described in Revelation, I don't know. Uh, Mind-altering drugs didn't exist at the time. Maybe they did. I don't know. But, but he, So he, he was an historical figure. He lived in Patmos. He wrote Revelation. I'm sure in, informed by a lot of other people uh, outside of Patmos. But that's what we know about the author of Revelation. Yes. Well, John, you've drawn a lot on Michael White's work with that video that we were that video was yes. the one produced by Michael White. Yes. Um, Michael has written on Revelation and has suggested, as I heard it, that a lot of the code in Revelation refers to Roman, the Roman Empire. Yes. And so um, that's right. It, it seemed to be a story about throwing off the Roman yeah, dominance. Yes, and thank you. So if, when you look at Revelation, you'll see that it's made up of seven letters. The Christian community. They identify the community, right? So he's writing to these communities about what they're doing, what they've done, and what they should expect. And yeah, it's it, it's very much uh, focused on Rome and the influence of Rome and the need to take Rome by storm. Yeah, and very much of a contemporary document. Not really meant to, to describe Something that's going to happen next Tuesday. <laughs> when was Revelation written then? Uh, about it, uh, just around the time of John. Okay, around the one ten. Yeah. yeah. It, it, by the way, it was one of the scriptures that they debated about whether they were going to include in the New Testament because it's so weird. What did we do with this thing? But they did. We'll, we'll talk about this next week. But well, one one of the challenges that Christian leaders had was, okay, there's, we believe there's something called scripture. What should be included in scripture? What gospels should be included? What New Testament writings should be included? And that discussion uh, finally uh, deter determined the content of the New, New Testament. There was no inspiration from God about what should be scripture and what's not. It was a decision that leaders made about what was truly scriptural and what should be included in the New Testament and what should not. And next week we're going to talk more about what life was like for Christians as they began forming their own community uh, and as they began uh, developing their own sense of what Christianity was and all the options out there for what could have been included but was not. And also the influences of Rome and Latin and Greek culture on the belief system of Christianity. I'll give you a little, little brief glimpse. Christmas Day was a pagan ritual <laughs> celebrated at that time of the year. I'm not saying we, should, we shouldn't uh, honor Christmas. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's, it was not in, in the script, in the, in the Gospels. It was something borrowed from the culture of the time, as was many elements of the Christian belief that we understand today. I get it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next week, we're going to talk about the early Christian church. We're going to talk about how it grew, and we're going to talk about how it was positioned itself to be Christendom in Western Europe and the only Christian religion existing at the time. Okay? Amen. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen.